And did it come back? Good. 12 kinds of neighborhoods. I'm, I'm thinking we can only spend about half of our class time today on chapter 10 because we have to start chapter 11. And I'm on page 382 where it's talking about urban hierarchies. And <coughs> I thought it was interesting to see these 12 kinds of neighborhoods. <coughs> Urban core and see the full answer. There they are. You know what urban core means? Let's see. Is there a picture in this book of an urban core? Is it downtown? That would be downtown where all your tall buildings are urban pioneer you know what I think that they talk about these that would be people who are ha have any of you been in downtown I probably should quit asking this stuff because you guys just don't go anywhere you don't go see the springs in Missouri have any of you driven down in downtown Kansas City Missouri have you driven down by the tall buildings? Yes. <coughs> Have you driven up to the city market? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you seen all of those buildings that used to be old factories and warehouses that have been turned into apartment complexes? <coughs> so, you have been doing something. <coughs> Let me mark you here, Carla. We don't. We don't. And Drake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so the the urban pioneer up and coming, that would be <coughs> those people who are moving into those old buildings that have been turned into condos. New urban. Probably, have any of you, uh, when you're driving downtown on 71 Highway, have any of you noticed in areas where there's a bunch of old houses, there's some brand new homes being built in that area? That would probably be some of the new urban construction. Cul-de-sacs and kids, it says bedroom communities. That would be Belton and... No, not so much Belton. That would be Raymore. But see, when they say cul-de-sacs and kids, there aren't any little kids living on a, there are four houses on our call, you know what a cul-de-sac is? Where you turn down your road and it has a circle at the end, it dead ends, there's no way out. Okay, that's a suburban kind of thing that they do. And so they say, okay, so here we are in our <coughs> little Raymore cul-de-sac, but there aren't any kids there. They're just all older people. Yeah, but they're, acreages on that cul-de-sac and maybe people with young children don't want all that space <coughs> no wait a minute we did have a guy who just moved in who's got uh, two young children because he wants them to live in a place like that and eventually probably people with young children will move in and take over when all of us old people are dead and gone gotcha Anna thank you so we're looking at the, where the, the internet talks about 12 kinds of neighborhoods. Pedestrian, have any of you <coughs> driven down 150 Highway going toward Lee Summit or 291 Highway and you see off to the left, uh, it's a subdivision but the houses are built real close together and there's a whole bunch of little shops right in there. That's what they call a pedestrian where I think at Longview, over by Longview Community College, there's a Longview community over there where people build houses out here and they have all these little shops here. The idea is that everything's small enough where you can walk every place you want to go and kind of like rebuilding these small little town communities from the past. Historic, that would be just moving into an old part of town where you're preserving <coughs> history status or destination where's a where's a status place to live in kansas city 
Does anyone know someone who lives on the plaza? Mm -hmm. Do you call it the plaza or the plaza? Plaza. plaza. Something in between. I think I'm like a plaza. plaza. <laughs> plaza. Well, I think. <laughs> I think the wealthy people who live there call it the plaza. Well, they can call it what they want. Upper crust people. The upper crust yeah. people, that's right. So it's just like the, the status destination. Have any of you been shopping down at, uh, what is that down there? <coughs> uh, that they light up at Christmas time? I know what you're talking about, but I don't know what's All those about. lights are all over everywhere. And what's another destination for the wealthier, the people with status? I did some research on neighborhoods in Kansas City. It's pretty sad. It, it says the worst neighborhoods to live in. Then it says the best neighborhoods to live in. And the list of the best neighborhoods to live in were all in Overland Park, Kansas. <coughs> I'm going, that's not Kansas City. That's Kansas. But that's a destination. You follow me? So Johnson County, have you heard people talk about Johnson County, Kansas? Did you know there's a Johnson County, Missouri? said, no, when someone says Johnson County, they're talking about Kansas, where wealthy people live. And then Mission Hills, have you driven through Mission Hills? Big old mansions down there. So it's just like, it's like status and destination. Are you familiar with any ethnic neighborhoods in Kansas City? Where predominantly, the Northeast used to be predominantly Italian. And now I think it's predominantly, uh, is it Asian or Middle Eastern? I think it's Asian in the Northeast. The way to find out is just drive through that part of town and see what kind of shops and stores you see. Where I used to live, down by, <coughs> what's it called, Robindy neighborhood. <coughs> That's become a very uh, Islamic or Muslim neighborhood. Not completely, but there's a lot of Islamic families that have moved in there. There's a, an ethnic part of Kansas City where uh, Hispanics live. There's a part of Kansas City where Jewish people live. Where I used to live near Robindy, when we first moved in there, I went around looking in neighborhoods for homes, and I drove down one street, and I, <coughs> and a guy came out in his yard and said, may I help you? And I said, I'm just looking to see if there are any houses for sale on this street. And he looked at me and he said, uh, no, there aren't. I said, okay, I was just looking. And I left and said, I don't think that guy was very eager for me to look for a home in his neighborhood. So I left and started looking other places and come to find out this one little neighborhood was African-American, like a little island right out in Raytown, Missouri, which has historically been a white community. But because, now you understand historically when a neighborhood was a white community, and the book talks about this in this chapter, that they had covenants, they had, you would sign a paper when you bought a house they said you will not sell your house to an African American or to a Hispanic or to a, I mean they had groups of people you couldn't sell your house to to live in that neighborhood 
because they were trying to preserve its ethnicity. Well, bottom line is they were being discriminatory and the court said you can't do that anymore. But in Raytown, there was this one little neighborhood where I, I suppose what happened is some black person, some African American bought some land and developed it and since all of the rest of Raytown could only be sold to white people, what did he conclude for his neighborhood? It could only be sold to black people. And he was able to do it because Raytown did it. And he said, and he would say, I can do the same thing Raytown does. So you, you have to understand <coughs> there are ethnic groups that you'll find in a city. Uh, active resort. Are there any resorts? Anybody? Any particular resort area around here? That would be what? People who live in uh, Branson? What about golf? Have any of you driven down 150 Highway, go up 71 to 150, make a right turn, and off to the right, there's a huge big flag flying from this subdivision that's full of apartments, and what's all around the apartment complex? A golf course. Have any of you seen a place where a golf course, all the houses are built interspersed with a golf course? Well, there you go. That's a kind of neighborhood. Have any of you been to a retirement neighborhood? There's one in Raymore called Foxwood Springs. <coughs> There's one in Belton. I forget the name of the one in Belton. It's just where retired people live and want to pay somebody to do all the yard work and take care of everything. Have any of you been to a rural neighborhood? You go, what is that? See, I thought rural was where all the farmers live. Well, it is, but have any of you ever been someplace where right out in the middle of a farming community, somebody has built a little subdivision where people who want to live out in the country move out there, but they want to live in houses that are close to each other, but they want that rural setting, but they also <coughs> want to be close with others and have all the amenities of city living. I still remember my wife was a little shocked when we moved into this house in <coughs> Raymore, and she found out this house wasn't on city sewers. No, it has its own sewage system. It's called a septic tank. I mean, out in the country? Now, we get city water because the county has put in water with the Missouri River and all the water there. Everybody, pretty much, no matter where you are, you pipe in water. Although some farmers say city water is too expensive to buy, so they drill wells to get their water. But when we had a drought a few years ago, some farmers' wells were drying up, so they were forced to use city water, which made the price of milk go up because all the dairy farmers were having to pump water or buy water from the city to feed their cattle. Uh, what else did I have here from Kansas City? <coughs> Let me just type this one in. Five. Let's just type in neighborhoods in Kansas City. Neighborhoods in Chicago, Seattle, Manhattan, Rome, Atlanta, Barcelona. We want Kansas City. In Kansas City, Missouri. Images of neighborhoods. These are the 10 worst neighborhoods in Kansas City. North Blue Ridge, <coughs> South Blue Valley, Northeast Industrial District, Ivanhoe Southeast. And they talk about why they call them the worst. These are the best neighborhoods to live in, Kansas City, Cherry Hill, 
Knoll Hill, Sylvan Grove, Pinehurst. Notice all of those say Overland Park, Kansas. The 10 best Kansas City neighborhoods to live in. <coughs> Armor Hill, Armor Fields, Ward Parkway, Warnall Homestead. You understand all these are neighborhoods in Kansas City. Have you heard of any of these neighborhoods? <coughs> Kansas City, Missouri neighborhoods. Look at this, Wikipedia. Kansas City, Kansas. Nearly 200 the city neighborhoods and community service departments maintains an official registry of organized neighborhood associations which overlap and there's nearly 240 neighborhoods. 240 neighborhoods. So what neighborhood did you live in? If your mailing address is Kansas City. <coughs> gotcha, Adrian. I lived in, let's see, I lived in Carlton Square, right next to Robindy. And what was that? That was a neighborhood. That was a subdivision called Carlton Square. And yet my mailing address was Kansas City, Missouri. I lived in Kans I lived in two places in Kansas City, Missouri, and they both had a Kansas City, Missouri address, but they were different neighborhoods. And often neighborhoods have to do with how the people settle there, or many times it's what the developer called the neighborhood when they built the neighborhood. <coughs> I lived in Johnson County at one time, over there where that wealthy area, but I didn't live in a wealthy part of Johnson County. I lived in <coughs> Roland Park. And it was a tiny little northeast corner of Johnson County that was a bunch of little old cottages that were built 60 years ago. And it was completely different than the west, rest of Johnson County, but it was a neighborhood with a Johnson County address. And it's just, that's why I guess page 382 talks about urban hierarchies. And that would be how neighborhoods take on a sense of identity as to who they are and then how people decide where are the good ones and where are the bad ones and that kind of thing. There's a list of the greater downtown neighborhoods. 18th and Vine. Anyone ever been down there? Home of the Blues. And the Negro League Baseball stuff. Boy. I wish I would have lived to watch Satchel Paige pitch. You don't know who he is? He was such a phenomenal pitcher in the Negro Baseball League that all he needed was a catcher and a couple of fielders to catch the fly balls and put people out when he didn't strike them out. And if he would have been allowed to play in the major leagues when he was younger, who knows what would have happened. The River Market, you can tell that's down where the River Market is. <coughs> hospital Hill, <coughs> that's obviously where there's a hospital up on the hill. <coughs> east Side, the east side of Kansas City. I mean, it's just amazing here. All of these areas. Let's just click on Ivanhoe. Oh, they don't have a thing with just Ivanhoe on it. Well, then let's find another one here that looks interesting. Oh, let's click on this one. Yeah, that one's up north.
<coughs> when I go up to watch my grandson play baseball at Park, I drive, if I drive up north of Parkville, the old city, there's this big lake up there called Reese Lake and all these very expensive homes all the way around it. Midtown, Westport, <coughs> Northeast, Northland, wow, the Plaza area. Do any of you ever go shopping at the Country Club Plaza? Do you go in the stores and buy things or just walk by the stores and look in the windows and mm -hmm. say, I've been to the plaza, the plaza. South Kansas City. Blue Ridge Farm, Calico Farms. They've taken these old farms and turned them into subdivisions and they become neighborhoods. Richards Gebauer, that's where we are. Anybody, anybody know why this is called Richards Gebauer? It's named after two military people. <coughs> a guy named Richards and a guy named Gebauer. And you can research the history. And this neighborhood is a neighborhood that's made up of us as a college, the airport where they park cars, the industrial complex around us, and then all of the houses that used to be a part of the Richards Gebauer complex south of us. All of that military housing. Well, we better leave that and move on. Oh, yeah, because I said, you know what? What about, uh, what did I have down here? Neighborhoods. Let's just erase this and start over. Neighborhoods. in Russia. Neighborhoods in Russia. Ethnic neighborhoods in Russia. <coughs> what does this say? Ethnic neighborhoods solidifying in Moscow. A Russian realtor says, New arrivals to the Russian capital prefer to live with their co-ethnics and co-religionists <coughs> already here, and that this widespread <coughs> preference is leading to the formation of increasingly clearly defined ethnic enclaves. What is that all about? Did you know in Moscow, uh, there's a lot of things that people who were born in Moscow, a lot of jobs they don't want to have. So they hire ethnic groups from other places to do the work. And when those people move to town, they gravitate to live with other people from their home country. And now these ethnic enclaves <coughs> have developed. I don't know. If I can find a picture, let me see if I can find a picture of Russian neighborhood. Pictures of Russian neighborhoods. See what that does for us. this one. Maybe this 
this one down here gives us a, maybe this one gives us a better picture. No, let's move on. <coughs> let's look at some other pictures here. Well, I'm not. There, okay, this picture kind of helps you understand. See how you can, this guy who's taking this picture, can you see where there's Apartments here and apartments on both sides. Well, guess what's behind where he's standing? An apartment complex that looks just like this one. In Russia, they would look at the way we build neighborhoods and say, what are you people thinking? They would build, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven stories high and have them built in the shape of a rectangle, or I mean of a square or a rectangle, and then inside would be a parking lot for cars, a playground for the children, even a kinder, a, a little a <coughs> garden for kids to go who aren't school age yet and old enough to walk down the street to go to the elementary school or the high school, and they would have and, and they would have a little drugstore there and a little grocery store, where everybody could actually live in their own little complex, fortified complex. So the only people who get in are the people who live there and they have all this security for their children to play in this little courtyard in the middle. Is that pretty cool? And they would look at the way we build with all these houses spread out like that and they'd say, that's just not the way to develop your neighborhood. But that's not the only kind they have. You see some others too. That's obviously a wealthy neighborhood there. That's obviously a poorer neighborhood there. And there's where, look how many families you can put in one of these buildings as opposed to <coughs> spreading all the houses out all over the land. Then you can use the land for garden, for playground, for parking cars, and for having your own little park there. Isn't that a cool idea? I mean, when I was in Russia, I thought this is so cool to see the way they live. When I was in Brazil, talk about neighborhood okay every house is its own neighborhood when I was in Brazil every house had a courtyard had a had a big wall built around it and it was made out of concrete and when the concrete was wet they would put pop bottles in the concrete and then after the concrete would dry they would break the tops off the pop bottles so they have nothing but jagged glass on top of their wall what to is, keep all the intruders out. And I said, what is that all about? And that's what it was. That was to keep out intruders. So it would be painful for somebody to climb over the wall and steal your stuff and try to get away without cutting themselves. And I'm going, whoa. Whoa. On page uh, 384, it talks about urbanization today. <coughs> and that would be... Probably the, uh, I, I tried to look for some stuff to find it, but, well, maybe to show you, let's see if I can find one this way. Let's go back. Okay. Oh, let's just close it down and start over. I think I can find it this way. Empty, E, M P T Y Empty Cities in China. Empty Cities in China twenty eighteen. <clears throat> Videos? Yeah, let's look at this. Why are there dozens of ghost the cities? Stretch into the sky. <coughs> traffic lights flash with no traffic in sight. The neon lights are on, but nobody's home. These are China's ghost cities, sprawling, empty spaces, just waiting for one thing. People. <laughs> All of them were bizarre. 
all of them were surreal. I, there's no other way to describe just a city meant for thousands of people that's just completely empty. The few people that live here often wonder if they'll ever get neighbors. Samuel Stevenson Yang is a photographer working to document this modern Chinese phenomenon. I think the mission started because it was just hard for people to believe exactly how much empty property was all over the country. And we, you know, we had to just go in person to take photos so that we could show people just the sheer scale of the building that was going on. As China's mass construction phase continues, bigger and more elaborate but empty cities are popping up. It's difficult to say just how many properties lay empty across China, but some guess it could be as high as 64 million. I was essentially able to like walk through this, you know, Manhattan-sized, you know, new city, you know, before it was, you know, completely built. So you see the the, the thickets of, you know, skyscrapers. I mean, we're talking like really, really, you know, super tall skyscrapers. You know, everywhere, and I was just able to kind of just walk through this area, and I was like, I mean, it's something that's kind of like, you know, kind of like, kind of like a nightmare, or like, you know, kind of dystopian movie of the future. And you just wake up, and all the people are gone, and it's just you and these like empty, you know, you know, husk of, you know, buildings everywhere. Hello, Wade Shepherd, VagabondJourney.com. I'm in Ur Ardwosa. So Wade Shepherd's been documenting ghost cities since 2006. I mean, how, how long does anyone think it takes to, to to populate a new city? I mean, this is an experiment that people haven't really done before. He sees the phenomena in a positive light, explaining ghost cities are just going through a stage between construction and inhabitation. There you go. Well, Did a lot you of catch that? I got their start in around 2000, 2003. They're, they're pretty well, they're pretty well. Did you catch that? Okay, they say there's 68 million ghost city or houses for 68 million people. The, considering the population of China, 68 million empty homes is just a small fraction of their population. And what's happening is, and <coughs> the one thing that the Chinese government, if you saw those pictures, has decided is that we do not want slums like the rest of the world has. And to avoid slums, we build government housing. <coughs> hey, we build government housing on a scale that where we build cities with the idea that people will move here and this will become a place where there will be jobs here and uh, businesses here and the cities will fill up eventually. Because we've built them so it's a place for people to live. The people just haven't decided to live there yet because they're so accustomed to living in these few large cities. And the idea is that they want people to move into these little cities that they've built. And probably based on China's history, if people don't voluntarily move to those cities they've built, and companies don't move there with their, it's, it's like, well, we can't move our factory there until there are people living there. And the people who are living say, well, I can't live there until there's a job there. It could be that the government will just mandate that this company is going to move to this city and all the people who work for them are going to move to this city too and if you don't want to work for that company and live in that city then you'll just have to get another job. You, you understand how they just mandate that stuff in China. Could you get away with doing that here in the United States? There's no way. There's no way. But because the government has that kind of control in China that's what they're doing. And th the point is and when we and the, this this comes under this urbanization today, they're trying to avoid what you see on page <coughs> 385, a picture in Bolivia of what was the downtown core city where the high rises are, the tall buildings, and all this stuff around has just developed into a big slum. And China says we do not want slums to develop. And to avoid that, we're going to build houses. And 68 million empty places, hey, that's that's small potatoes. Okay, we'll stop there and move on and probably go back to this again a little bit later. Because it's so interesting. And there's so much out there to look at.
on page 386 it talks about government policies uh, let's talk about some government policies in our country that tend toward improving life in the country <coughs> did you know that if a person goes to medical school and borrows a whole bunch of money to pay for his medical schooling that if he's willing to locate into a small town in the country that often that small town government will pay off his medical bills and his debts in order for him to agree to live there and practice medicine for six or eight years hoping that maybe he'll decide this is where he wants to spend the rest of his life and can you see say, where some people who go to medical school and have a big bill when they graduate, they go, you know, I could go into a practice in the city where there's already a lot of doctors, but if there's a town out here that'll pay my bills off, if I'll move there and set up a practice, then why not move out there in the country? So there are some things that we're doing in America to, to give people an incentive to move out there like that. Um, is anyone here live near Salina, Kansas? Okay, I'm, I'm driving to Salina. A church asked me to preach out there one Sunday. I'm driving out there, and on my way, I pass this huge, big light bulb factory. And I'm thinking, why would General Electric build a light bulb factory near Salina, Kansas? Why would Russell Stover's have one of their candy plants near Salina, Kansas? And guess what? Salina went out <coughs> advertising. I found this out from people in the church. They advertised. People in Salina are hardworking, honest. They'll do what you tell them. They have Midwestern values. Build your factory here and your labor costs will be minimal because you won't have all the problems you have with labor costs in the city. And so they move out there and build a factory. Well, Russell Stover's builds a candy making plant. And then General Electric says to Russell Stover's or Westinghouse, so how's it going? And they say, hey, it's going great. They go, well, we'll build a light bulb factory. Now, can you see what would happen if too many factories moved to Salina and there weren't enough people in Salina to provide the workforce, then they'd be in trouble. But Salina, I think, is trying to maintain a balance to where if our city grows, then we'll look to recruit more industry to come here, to give our people here. And, of course, can you see what happens? The young people in Salina, if they can get a job in town, why would they leave and move to Kansas City or to Lawrence or someplace else? So you can improve the quality of life in your city or your neighborhood just by making it more appealing. Page 389 talks about the internal geography of cities, and it shows these pictures. I, I, and I think this is a good picture, except they don't all fit this, but it, it, the idea that there's a central business district, a transition zone, a zone of independent workers' homes, a zone of better residents, and then commuters who live out on the edge and commute to work. <coughs> and Sometimes that means they drive to work and have to have parking downtown, and other times that means they take public transportation. And then it shows on page 390 and 391 how this same kind of thing can be reconfigured in different ways for different cities. On page 390, here's a picture of one where <clears throat> you've got the center city, but then you have <clears throat> these other industries <coughs> that are kind of like this transportation and industry in purple <coughs> and then um, low class you go I don't like that lower class okay why don't we say uh, low income how's that people who have a low income and then that means high class would be people who have a high income and middle class would be people who have an average or a middle, near the middle income. <clears throat> I mean, sociologists are pretty insensitive the way they throw around some of these words to describe groups of people. And 
I just am kind of bothered by some of it. On page 392, it talks about the government's role in terms of restrictions and zoning and what can be built where and eminent domain. There used to be an old brick house on 58 Highway right across the street from Walmart where the Lowe's and uh, Golden Buffet are. And all that land in there that was sold to Sam's Club and Lowe's <coughs> and Office Max and Golden Buffet belonged to an old farmer. And after he sold all that land and made all that money, he thought he was going to live in that house till he died. And the city said, uh, you know, your house doesn't fit in with this commercial zone, so we're going to use eminent domain to condemn your house so it can be torn down and we can build more little shops in here. And that's where all that little cluster of shops is built on what was his place where he lived. And there, there got to be a whole bunch of people in Raymore who said, that's not right, that's not fair, and they went to his defense and he said, if I would have known they were going to do this to me, I never would have sold the land to Lowe's or <coughs> Sam's Club in the first place. Well, just remember, eminent domain says, have you ever driven down a street where there are four lanes of traffic, but it used to be two lanes of traffic? But so many people are using the road, they've widened the road. Have you ever noticed how close the edge of the road is to some people's door, front doors or the side of their house? So if you live on a busy street, don't be surprised if eminent domain says, we're taking half of your yard to make another lane of traffic for all the cars driving up and down your street. I mean, it used to be when I would come to Calvary to work, I would drive down Madison to County Line Road, make a left turn, and drive all the way to school without ever seeing a car. And now, I get to the corner of Madison and County Line Road and there's two or three cars waiting in front of me and there's two or three cars behind me because it's becoming busier because the, as we talked about <coughs> the other day, the population in, in Raymore has just exploded, has doubled, and now all those people have to have some way. In fact, uh, there's a subdivision in Raymore. It's named after some farmer. Does anyone know what that subdivision is called that's right south of 58 Highway? It's named after some rancher who owned all that land and he sold it to a developer. And when they first started to develop those homes, the only way they could get on Highway 71 was down one little access road next to Burger King. And there were always 10 or 12 cars backed up. So finally the city said, you know, this is too much congestion, and they built, what would it be, two miles south of 58 Highway, they built an interchange where people from that subdivision have another way to get on 71 Highway to go to work. But until they built that interchange, it was really a bottleneck there. And usually things do turn into a mess till the government steps in and says we're gonna do something about it. <clears throat> There's a picture on page 393 of Brasilia. Why would this book bring up Brasilia? Well, you have to understand that the capital of Brazil used to be in Rio de Janeiro. And the president of Brazil said, you know what? I go to other countries and I see where their capital is and I'm embarrassed that our capital is in Rio de Janeiro. So we're going to build a new capital 600 miles away out in the middle of nowhere <clears throat> and, it's, and we're going to call it Brasilia and it's going to be our capital. And they did that back in 1960. And if you look at a map <coughs> of Brasilia, you'll see that it's built in the shape of an airplane the big fuselage and the wings coming out. And then they even built a lake around it. 
And the idea was that they're going to build out here in the middle of nowhere, and the only people who live here will be people who work for the government, so there'll be no slums. Well, guess how that worked out? In every major city in Brazil, you'll find areas where, okay, maybe that's a, a, a too negative of a word to use, but there'll be areas of people who don't own homes, who can't buy a home, who don't have a job, so they just uh, put up a tent or a shack built out of scrap stuff they find, and they just live there. And what do they do for electricity? They throw a wire over the electric line going by and uh, hook it up to run their lights and their television. And what do they do for food? Food grows in Brazil, like in California. So you just walk around and pick stuff off of trees growing wild. But what happened in Brasilia is they hired a bunch of people to come here and do all this work <coughs> to build the city with the idea that when the city is built, they'll go back to where they came from. That's not true. They stayed there. So Brasilia has the same slum problem, not as big as it is in Rio de Janeiro, but they have the same slum problem that other cities have in Brazil. Simply because people move to town because there's nothing in the country, but there's nothing in the city, but they're hoping for something, so they move there, and the end result is uh, there's no place to stay. But in Brazil, after traveling through Brazil, when I came back here to the States, we're driving down the interstate, I said, Nina, See that little stream running to, uh, underneath the interstate here? She goes, yes. And I said, in Brazil, there would be a little conclave of homeless people, who people who don't own their own homes, who would have put up tents and who just made a home around this little enclave, and that's where they would be living. Because the climate lends itself to that, and they can live that way. There's a picture on page 394 of... Uh, low-income housing in Newark, New Jersey, building housing for poor people. Now, you see in the picture behind, there's a, whole, a big old high-rise building. That was the first approach. I think we borrowed that idea from Russia. I don't think anybody wants to say that, but when I look at the buildings in Russia, I think that's what it looks like. They thought if we build these great big high-rises, then we'll have little apartments for all the poor people to live in. But what happened is, they used to have some of those here in Kansas City, and they blew them up and bulldozed them and built a bunch of these little homes like you see in the front. Because it seems to be that there's less crime and people take more pride in ownership to own one of these little apartments or live in one of these than they do in a big high rise. So the idea of building these big high rises for low income people in America, um, We've pretty much blown most of those up and replaced them with these little uh, cottage front homes that look more appealing and have more appeal. And again, if you look in downtown Kansas City, say, well, what did you do to replace that big high rise that you blew up to make housing for low income people? Look at all the little buildings. Just when you drive down 71 Highway, look at the new construction on both sides of the road and you'll see this same kind <coughs> of picture, same kind of housing for people. <coughs> Uh, page 396 talks about the Islamic urban form. And does anyone know what's the... Okay, the center of a city in America is the tall buildings downtown, downtown where the main businesses are. Does anyone know what's the center of a Muslim city? Where people go to pray every day? The mosque. The mosque. So they have a different kind of construction in their cities. They have like this mosque and then all this other stuff around it. <coughs> see how this market street here is built in such a way so you can see the tower at the mosque, the minarets, towers for calls to prayer. So 
their religion compels them to build their cities differently than we do here. So I thought, you know, a lot of our ancestors came from England. So I typed in, I googled neighborhoods in England. <laughs> and what it said was, there are no certain kinds of neighborhoods. It's like there's every kind of neighborhood and each neighborhood is its own distinct kind. You couldn't even, in England, they won't even try to categorize neighborhoods because they say England is just a big city full of individual neighborhoods. It was really interesting to see what the internet had to say about that. All right, we better. 401, the social cost of neighborhoods. Sociologists and mass marketers can construct an astonishing accurate profile <coughs> of people on the basis of their address alone. That's on the basis of their zip code. You can type in a zip code and learn all kinds of things. So when you're looking for a certain neighborhood or a type of neighborhood in America, probably the best way to do that to find, because if you look at all these neighborhoods in Kansas City, it's hard to find the outlines for them, and many of them are so small. But if you look at zip codes, you can learn a lot about uh, the people who live there based on their zip code. Doesn't mean everybody who lives there is like that, but uh, there's enough, there's enough uh, similarity between all the people in that neighborhood that marketing people use zip codes all the time to sort out the junk mail they send out. And we talked earlier about homeowners associations discriminating against certain people living in a neighborhood. That's Hopefully that's dying out in America. We need to get beyond that. Page 404 shows a picture. It says road rage. Do you see anybody? Maybe that's back there where those cars are not lined up. Somebody's trying to get in and somebody doesn't want to let them in. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any videos of road rage? People just going bonkers? Oh yeah. Because someone honked at them or someone wouldn't let them in or someone was following them too close? Some of us might be guilty of that. And you know who's, you know in that picture on page 404 there, who's gonna aggravate some people real fast and that's that guy on that motorcycle? Isn't it? I mean, if he doesn't watch it, if he starts revving his motorcycle up and gunning it between those cars, somebody's going to open their door and crash him. <laughs> and it's like, why is that? Because stay in line. So what? You have a motorcycle. <coughs> it doesn't give you the right to go between the lines and go as you want and do whatever you want. And some guy opens his door and crashes the motorcycle and the motorcyclist friends get his license tag number and find out where he lives and pay him back and all of a sudden I mean if somebody used to cut me off on the highway I would honk at him to say hey be be more courteous and I quit honking because of road rage <laughs> I'm thinking go ahead and honk at the guy who just cut you off and he'll pull over the side of the road and get out with his high-powered rifle and start shooting at your car I'm thinking what has happened in America to us just crazy things. Uh, there's also a picture on 404 of a new planned town, Valencia, California, where they just said, look, let's do what China did. Let's just go plan a city out here and let's plant the city and move people and industry there, but not compel them to go, but make it <coughs> inviting enough where a bunch of people want to move there. And sure enough, there's a town that's uh, been built and you can Google Valencia, California and learn all about that one. Malls, 
Have any of you been to visit a mall? Have any of you been to Bannister Mall? Maybe. I forget the names of them. Yeah. Down off Bannister Road, right next to 70, not right next to I-435? I think so, yeah. Did any of you ever go to Bannister Mall? You did, Anna? When you were a little girl? Yeah. Really. <coughs> Anyone know where Bannister Mall is now? They bulldozed it. <coughs> they bulldozed the whole mall. The stores who used to sell stuff there, <coughs> when our girls were little, our daughter who's out of college now and been teaching for three years, that's our <coughs> granddaughter. So when my daughter, that was a long time ago, when she was little, we would go to Bannister Mall to go shopping. And there were license plates in the parking lot from Iowa and Nebraska and all over. And then all of a sudden, Bannister Mall becomes an unfavorable place to go shopping because of the violence. So all the stores who aren't selling things move out, bunch of empty stores, Danister Mall closes and they bulldoze it. Have any of you ever been to the Raytown Mall? It's not there either. It got <coughs> bulldozed and that's where a big Walmart is now. Have any of you been to Ward Parkway Mall? There's a whole bunch of malls that we used to have in this city that are now vacant and empty <coughs> and most of them They've tried to figure out other things to do with them, but most of them eventually just get bulldozed and they turn it into something else. An industrial complex? Um, I'm just telling you, if, if the people who run the malls don't <coughs> keep a positive image for their mall, for both the people who sell things and the people who buy things, that mall will eventually close. Let's see. I think maybe that's enough of this chapter. We've talked on page 412 about redistributing jobs and housing. That would be jobs going out to Salina, Kansas. What kind of jobs have moved out of Kansas City to some of the <coughs> suburbs? Do any of you know? Does anyone know about Sprint Center or the Sprint Campus? Mm -hmm. Why did they build this great big telecommunication, com telecommunication complex out in the middle of uh, an old farm in Johnson County rather than downtown because they wanted to redistribute the business and the people that they were going to hire to work for them and the people who worked for them, where were they living? In the Johnson County area? So let's make it easy for people who work for us to get to work. Let's build our huge complex out here in a suburban area rather than in the downtown area, the old uh, traditional format. Page 416 talks about controlling sprawl in metropolitan Portland. Now, do you understand why Portland, Oregon has a compelling reason <coughs> to control sprawl? Well, they don't have a lot of room for growth. The same with New Jersey. See the picture on page 417 of New Jersey? They don't have a lot of room for growth. Kansas City, I mean, just take your arms and make a big circle around the heart of Kansas City, and how much room do we have for growth? Isn't the mailing address for the college Kansas City, Missouri? Okay, do you know what's between us and the rest of Kansas City, Missouri? Grandview. 
My mailing address is Raymore because I live in Raymore. People who live in Belton have a Belton mailing address. People who live in Grandview have a Grandview mailing address. Why do we have a Kansas City address? Because when the government gave Calvary this campus, they gave this property to Kansas City, Missouri. If they would have given it to Belton, we would have a Belton address. If they would have given it to Grandview, we would have a Grandview address. They gave it to Kansas City. And why did they give it to Kansas City? Because Kansas City gave it to them for an air base years ago. And Grandview just kind of grew up as a small town in between. So that's why Kansas City has grown beyond Grandview. It's grown beyond Raytown. It wouldn't surprise me if, in fact, it's grown <coughs> beyond uh, North in Northtown, Gladstone, it's grown beyond, you can take little pockets, you can look at a map of Kansas City and see little pockets where it's in Raytown, Grandview, and uh, Gladstone, and then you'll see Kansas City surrounding them because Kansas City has grown beyond the limits of those cities. And apparently, here in this Midwest, we could just keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And how do we know how big we are? Well, every city usually has an interstate that goes all the way around it. What's the interstate that goes all the way around Kansas City? 435 up to the airport, 635 on the Kansas side, coming back around to 435, and just a big old loop. And the idea is that that's not containing Kansas City, that's an interstate to help alleviate congestion when you're driving someplace in Kansas City, but Kansas City is on both inside that interstate, but also outside that interstate as well. It's interesting to see how this stuff develops, which takes us to the end of chapter 9, chapter 10, I'm sorry, and brings us to chapter 11. Okay, so chapter 10, your discussion assignment was to uh, research your hometown and write up a little history of your hometown. I've noticed already somebody has researched Harrisonville. Any of you been to downtown Harrisonville? It's so cool. There's this courthouse and this square and all this little stuff around it. And at one time, wasn't there some rich guy who bought up a bunch of those buildings and was going to take historic Harrisonville and turn it into some kind of a little attractive place where people and companies would want to set up shop? And apparently it hasn't worked out like he thought. So when it came time, and I wrote mine on Raymore, but if you're from Raymore, you can write one on there too because there's plenty of other information to write about them. But you all know which home state I wrote about, don't you, if you haven't looked at the discussion page yet? Oklahoma. I mean, I just said, hey, page 423, we're a world of states. And we're the United States of America, and my home state is Oklahoma. So you pick a home state, and research it. And you know in doing this research, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma and I studied Oklahoma history and I even had to study the five civilized tribes in order to graduate from high school because Native American history is a big part of Oklahoma. But when I did this research for my home state, I learned something I never knew before. I have a picture. I don't know. Oklahoma, Grant County, 1907. Let's turn this on and see if I can find it. <coughs> what did I say that was? Oklahoma, Grant County, 1907. Grant 
County, Oklahoma, 1907 map. See if that gets it. Grant County, 1907 historical map. Can you all see that? And it's got, okay, now watch this. Remember Grant County, like we live in Cass County? Okay, this was the county where my uh, dad grew up in Oklahoma, and my mom did too. And there was Bounder Ten Banner Township, Berry Township, Bluff Township. See all these, remember, like what township do I live in? Raymore Township, Belton's and Belton Township. Well, let's see. Let's go down here and hit where my dad lived. Waukeda Township. Where's Waukeda Township? Waukeda Township. <coughs> Above and below. And it says, okay, and it says here, above. Can you see that township map? <coughs> Let me see if I can make it bigger. Now can you see it better? Where did it go? Oh there, I have to move it up like this. Oh, I should have written down which one it was. There's the bottom of it. W.F. Kittle Camp. Well, look at that. See that W. Can you see that W.F. Kittle Camp there? Mm -hmm. That's the farm where my dad grew up. His father rented this farm from W.F. Kittle Camp and lived on that rented farm his entire life. And look what's just north of that Kittle Camp farm. Can you read that name? W.C. Bonine? Can you read it now? Mm -hmm. Guess who that is? William Clinton Bonine, my great-grandfather. So, my dad grew up on the Kittle Camp farm and his dad homesteaded the farm north of the Kittle Camp farm. Isn't that interesting? And my grandfather, my great-grandfather, sold his farm, his homestead, and went to Texas to take up irrigation farming where he was going to get rich and he lost all of his money <laughs> and spent his declining years living with one of his daughters. <laughs> My grandfather who rented the Kittle Camp farm and lived on it his entire life said I'm not going to buy a farm. People who buy farms either sell them and make bad decisions or lose them to the bank when there's a drought I'm just going to rent my farm and live on a rented farm for our entire life. So the, sociolo the sociologists in the world call him a sharecropper, which is what my dad was too, because when he decided to be a farmer, he didn't have any farm to own, so he just rented farmland until he could eventually buy some. And, and, 
the sociology classes I took at the university, <coughs> they say all kinds of ugly things about sharecroppers. My grandfather was a sharecropper by sociological standards. He lived on a rented farm his entire life with no help from anybody else. He raised six children and sent all six of them to college. To me, that's pretty phenomenal. And I learned from reading the Manchester newspaper from back when my grandfather was a little kid that my grandfather played baseball for the Manchester baseball team. Does anyone know that it used to be every town had their own baseball team? Belton used to have a baseball team. Raymore had a baseball team. Grandview had a baseball team. And their baseball games were like the kind people go see at, in Omaha and Arkansas at the, you know, the, the games where they play, where, what do they call the, they're the, the feeder teams for the pros? Oh, the minor league? Minor leagues, that's it. They play for a minor league team. Okay, used to be before we had minor league teams and minor league baseball going on, <coughs> we had every town has its own baseball team. And they would go out and play against each other. And it was, it was a big enough deal where it got reported in the paper. And the paper reported that uh, Floyd Boni was playing in the outfield. And a guy hit what everybody thought was a home run, and Floyd saved the day. He caught that fly ball. That was the third out. And the Medford, whatever they were called, Mudcats, won the baseball game. And you know what's funny? My grandfather never in his entire life ever told any of us in the family that he played baseball for Medford when he was a, little, when he was a young guy. He just didn't talk about stuff. It's like he didn't talk about stuff like that. You, when you went to his house, you either uh, you were out working in the field or taking a nap, getting ready to go work in the field again, or eating. So there just wasn't much time for sitting around and just listening and talking about stuff. And I don't know if there's time to do this, but probably isn't. But if, if I scroll down on this thing to, uh, let's, let's go back and see what happens here. See if this will take us back. Maybe it won't. No, it's not going to take us back. If, if you remember all those townships, if I go back to Manchester Township, and I scroll down through the little... Do you understand what we're looking at here? Does everyone understand that these are... Let me... Let's see. That, that these are square miles. These are sections. Each of these is 160 acres. One quarter <coughs> of a section. And see here's where... W.F. Kittlecamp owned that one. He owned this one. This is the one my, my grandfather rented from him. But up here, so that would be one mile north, two miles north, and a mile west. On that quarter there was where my grandfather lived when his father homesteaded. He was a teenager when his grandfather homesteaded that. And... Uh, he married a girl from a township right south of here. And if I took time <coughs> to, to look at, and you can do this on all of your home state stuff. Just go do some research and look at these townships. And you see pictures of them. You see who lived, who owned the quarter there, who was the homesteader. And generally in Oklahoma, it was in 1907. But what's significant about 1907 is I think I put it on canvas under my discussion. In Oklahoma, in uh, 1895 or something, the five civilized tribes petitioned Congress to make Oklahoma a state, but make it a Native American state and call it Sequoia. And Congress rejected their application and then five years later announced <coughs> that it was going to be called Oklahoma 
and all of the Indian Territory was now a part of the United States of America without any regard to their Indian heritage. And no one told me that when I was growing up and going to school. Well, do you understand why they didn't tell me that? Did any of you grow up in the South where you studied the Civil War from a Southern perspective? Okay, when you studied the Civil War, were you told that the Civil War was over states' rights? And it was. The federal government said a state doesn't have the right to enslave people. And the state said, you can't make that decision. That's a state right. And the federal government said, no, in the United States, our, our Constitution doesn't, what you're doing is unconstitutional. You cannot hold people in slavery. You have to set all of your slaves free. And the southern states said, not going to happen. We'll, we'll pull out from the United States and form our own little union of states called the Confederacy. So do you understand when they said it was about state rights, they were telling you the truth. They just didn't tell you the whole truth. It was about a state's right to own slaves, to let, to let people own slaves. And part of what brought this whole thing to, to fruition <coughs> was this Homestead Act. You know, I've talked about the Homestead Act where all these people were able to W.C. Bonine got 160 acres, Aldridge got 160, W.F. Kettlecamp got 160, and Mary Hatfield got 160. <clears throat> and they lived on that, and they built a house, and they raised crops, and <clears throat> in seven years it was there. <clears throat> okay, prior, prior to the uh, Civil War, Congress <coughs> passed the Homestead Act. And it passed Congress but the president, who was a president from the southern states, vetoed it. And they didn't have enough votes to override the veto until all the southern senators pulled out to become a part of the Confederacy. And then they could pass the law because Abraham Lincoln was president then. And then they passed the Homestead Act. And... Uh, <clears throat> the Homestead Act they passed excluded anyone who fought against the United States in any <coughs> war. <coughs> so that means all the people in the South who fought for the Confederacy couldn't cash in on the Homestead Act. And they also announced <coughs> and any slave in the South who comes to the North and defends the Constitution of the United States is entitled to a homestead. Now, you didn't get that in your history, did you? From this, when They didn't teach you that. I'm telling you, folks, if you don't do your own homework and do your own research about your own home state, you won't learn. Is it okay to say this? you won't learn about the unpleasant parts of it. The history books just give us this glowing report. And it isn't like, yeah, a lot of good things came out of the South, but the Southern states made a huge mistake when they said, we want to keep enslaving people. That was a huge mistake on their part, and it cost them dearly. But see, the way they like to describe it is, it was over states' rights. And said, yes, it was. And the right they were fighting over was the right for one person to own another. And I say this over and over again. Did you know? Did you know there were some black people, free black people in America, who owned slaves? Well, guess what? What if a black man would have decided, a black free man? who had enough land said, you know what? I think I'm going to buy me some white slaves. What would have happened? 
I'm thinking there would have been a huge negative reaction to that, wouldn't there? So whenever you consider this thing of slavery, ask yourself, would it be okay if somebody put you on a ship against your will, transported you to Muslim North Africa, and sold you as a slave to work on a plantation. Would that be okay with you? No. Then it's not okay to turn it around and run the boat the other way. Okay. We'll talk about this world of states some more on Friday. In fact, we have to finish it up on Friday. But when you do your research, look for your name. Look for some of your ancestors back on these early 1900 property maps. That's so cool. When I look at the next one, it says Styles. That was my mother. That was my grandmother's maiden name.